Okay, welcome back to Kids Discover Egypt, day three. Are you guys ready for day three? I can't hear you, are you ready for day three? All right, that sounds great. My name is Diego de Goyen. Here is my co-host, Hatshepsut, and today we're gonna be making a scarab. See, this is a scarab beetle. Now the scarab beetle was really important to the ancient Egyptians. See, these beetles in Egypt, they used to go around and they would roll up big balls of poop. And then they would lay their eggs inside of these big balls of poop. Isn't that gross? But the Egyptians would see that the babies would come out of the poop. And so it became a symbol for rebirth. At the end of everything, something new comes of it. And so the scarab beetle became really important to the ancient Egyptians. So today we're gonna to be using a material called model magic. It's Crayola's model magic, and you can buy some online or at your craft store. I recommend buying one bag of white model magic. They sell it in different colors, but I'm gonna show you how you can actually change the colors of your white model magic by using some markers. So you'll need some markers and then you'll also need your model magic. And that is all we need for today. And we're gonna be making our very own scarab beetle. And an eight ounce bag will make you a pretty big beetle. So you can make yours as big as mine or even a little bit bigger if you want to. So without further ado, let's jump right into today's activity. Okay, for today's activity, all we need are some markers and one bag of Crayola Model Magic. So, we'll start off by opening up our Model Magic. And don't open this bag up until you're ready to use it because once it's open, it basically starts the drawing process and you, you won't be able to use it after a day or so. So you wanna make sure you finish it as soon as um, you open it. So we can take a piece of our model magic. So I'm going to put down some scratch paper so that uh, I don't get the tablecloth too dirty. But the model magic is just kind of squishy and you can tear it apart and you can make different shapes with it. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to tear out a little piece and I'm gonna show you how you can add some color to these. You can buy them in different colors, but you don't need to, you can just buy the white one. And with your marker, you can actually pull out a color that you want. I'm going to pick blue, and you can add some color to your model magic just by coloring it a little bit. Add some, some ink in there, and then you go ahead and put your marker away, and then you kind of Squish it and pull it together. And slowly, the other parts of the model magic will take on that blue. And you'll be able to change the color of your, your model magic that way. And so you can see it's becoming kind of a lighter blue. And if you want it to be a darker blue, all you have to do is take your marker back out, and add a little bit more color. So add some more color to that. And you can even mix colors together if you wanted to get really creative with whatever color you, you make. So there we go. Your hands might get a little dirty during this process, so just be aware of that. Today's the dirty day. We have some messy materials. But luckily, Model Magic isn't too bad. It stays together for the most part. So the best way to mix the color in, I think, is to just kind of stretch and fold the model magic out and slowly it all becomes kind of a single, a single hue. Hue is another word for color. Go 
ahead and add a little bit more marker and get a darker blue out of it. You can even poke it with the marker like this. Many different ways to add color. Again, just kind of fold and squish, fold and squish. Okay, so now I have a color that I like. It's kind of this light blue color. And this color kind of resembles the color of a material called faience. Faience was a very important material to the Egyptians and it was invented by them. It was a type of clay that they mixed with something called carbon cobalt. And uh, when that was put in a kiln, a kiln is a type of oven for clay. And when they put the faience in the, in the kiln and heated it up to very high temperatures, temperatures like 2000 degrees, and, uh, and put it in there for maybe a day, it would turn into this very vibrant blue color. Now this obviously isn't going to do faience justice, but for the purposes of this project, this blue is good enough. So today what we're gonna be making is a scarab. And since we have a lot of model magic, especially in one of these bags, you don't need to get a bag as big as this one. This is an eight ounce bag. Uh, you can get something half this size um, and you should be fine. But since we have so much of it, we might as well make uh, a pretty big scarab. So the way I like to make a scarab is I like to make it in pieces and then attach the pieces. So the first thing that I'm gonna do, I'm, gonna, I'm from memory, I'm kind of thinking about the, uh, the scarabs that we have here in our collection some of the clay scarabs. And these scarabs, um, they had a flat bottom. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna make like a flat oval. So what I like to do is I like to take my marker and use it kind of like a rolling pin. And then this way we get a nice flat surface at that. Now I can kind of fine tune the shape a little bit. So an oval is kind of like a circle, but it's a little bit stretched in one direction. So we're going to make this oval shape. So this will be the base of my scarab, this flat oval. And so this would basically be kind of like a, uh, a stand for the, for the scarab. Okay. So with this piece, because this piece is a little bit smaller, what I'm gonna use this piece for is actually the head of my scarab. So I'm gonna kind of roll it into a circle like this with my hands, and then I'm gonna roll it up and down and it becomes kind of this big oval shape. That looks pretty good. So those are two parts so far for my scarab. Now you have a couple of options. The model magic is pretty sticky towards itself. So I'm going to actually set that part aside. So that way it doesn't get stuck to it. I like to flatten it out a little bit so I can see how big it is on my stand. Okay. 
I'm going to take a little bit more Modern Magic. Okay. We're going to try to make a pretty big potty for it and see if this is enough here. That's my head. This is the body. Maybe a little bit more. I want to try to get the proportions of this right so that it looks correct. And proportions mean that everything looks like it's the right size and it fits together. So, uh, so for me, see my hands, my fingers are in proportion to my hand, right? If my fingers were as thick as two fingers, that would be out of proportion. We want to make sure everything looks like it's somewhat the right size. I think that might look pretty good. Beetles kind of have a, a fat body compared to their head. I think that might look pretty good. Okay, so this looks like it's enough clay. Since so now it's just about getting the shape right. And the shape will kind of be like an oval again with uh, a little bit of a longer side where the head and the, the back end are. Okay. And I actually would like to make this blue as well. So we're gonna add a lot of marker to this. I think poking it like this might be the best way to do it. Auto magic's a lot of fun to play with. It's very relaxing to just squeeze and, and stretch it out. Let's see, does it match our head yet? Not quite. We're probably going to have to add some more blue to it. Yeah. It's getting pretty close. It's a little bit lighter than the body still, but I think that's okay. Or excuse me, the head. I think that will be okay. So, now we're gonna get our shape now. Let's see here. We want it to be kind of like an oval again. You know, the shape of a beetle. And the handouts from the previous days actually have a scarab beetle on it. So if you wanted to look at that as an example, you can do that. Okay, that's a nice shape there. So let's see. That's our head. I think maybe a little bit shorter of an oval. But nice big body, I like that. And then we can kind of make part of the head. So this is where the head will attach to the body. Okay, there we go. That's pretty good. And I don't want to connect them just yet. I'm going to make all my pieces to the puzzle separately. And then at the end, we can attach all of the parts of the scarab together. I think that's looking pretty good though. Okay, so, so far we have two shapes down. Now, we're gonna make some more complicated shapes. And although I started off with blue and 
trying to make this maybe a more realistic scarab, I think we're going to start adding in some different colors to add some contrast. And I'd like the pattern on the back of the scarab to be orange. So I'm going to take this piece and I'm going to add orange to it. And the color orange and blue are actually complementary colors. So that means that the colors go together nicely and they look good next to each other. They complement each other. Another set of complementary colors are red and green. Just like Christmas. There's also purple and yellow. A lot of sports teams use complementary colors, like the Lakers. Okay, we're getting more of an orange color now. I hope you guys can see that okay on camera. It's pretty. It's kind of a pale orange. You might want to do one more round of color just to make that a little darker. So now that we have our orange color, we're actually going to be separating this into different parts. So kind of following the pattern of the scarab on this sheet here, you guys should have this sheet in your workbook. You see how this is breaking up into three sections there? So we're going to make those three sections in our scarab. So the first section kind of looks like this. So let's set our other parts aside so we have a little bit more working room. So I think this is what the first section here is going to look like. I like this shape. Kind of looks like a shell, kind of like a seashell, right? And so once you have the shape down, then you can kind of use your mark, marker roll technique. You can kind of flatten it out a little bit. Okay, that's looking pretty good. So that will go there. Maybe make it just a little bit more squat. Okay, I'm liking that. That's going to look good right there. And then the next piece. We're going to have one on this side. I can actually draw it on the paper here. We're going to have one here, kind of like this. And then another one here, kind of like that. That might be a little hard to see, huh? How about this? We can draw it on the paper, kind of like that shape there, and this shape here. And then this part will go on top. And then we have a Y kind of in the middle there. That's how I like to think about it. So we'll make a couple more that fit into there. Just split this in half. One of the things I like to do if I'm trying to make the shape and it's getting a little bit too thin and I can't bring it back together, sometimes I'll just fold it and start over. And sometimes folding it will help you a lot. So don't forget to do that if you need to. Okay, that shape's looking pretty good. So let's flatten it out a little bit. Get nice and flat, get all those wrinkles and creases out of there. Okay, that looks good. And then again, we'll just tap it on the sides here. Okay, so I made a nice point here. 
get that that adds some nice shape to it okay remember just to be patient and you know work with the material and it's okay if you mess up because the model magic it's really easy to just start over just kind of fold it and keep going don't be discouraged okay I kind of want to make these more points now that I made this point over here. I kind of like the points. Maybe make this a point down here. Okay, this is looking pretty good. So now the last part, just this shape over here. That's looking pretty good. So we're getting close. Okay, so now we have a few more pieces to make. Grab some more of our model magic. And now we're gonna make the legs. So I think the legs should probably be the same color as the body. So we're gonna add some blue to this one. But you can do your scarab however you want. Every part can be a different color if you want to. Uh, and if you really wanted to, you could do no color, but color is just so much more fun. Now this is going to break up into six different parts, each being a different leg. So the best way to do it, I think, is to just roll it in your hand like this. If it gets too long, you can just fold it. And again, we're going to kind of follow what we have here as far as shape. That look big enough? This actually looks too small. I think I might need more clay. So what I'm going to do with this one instead is this is going to be one of the tiny side legs. So those are my tiny side legs. And then I think I might need more clay for these legs. This is going to be one of the bigger top legs. Now we have enough model magic for all of our legs. Another leg there. Then we need two more. legs because the back legs are going to be a little bit bigger. I like how different all the legs are. I think that looks good. So now we have all of the pieces to our scarab made. So we can start off with the body. I'm going to turn this around so my scarab faces me. So find the side that you like that's a little nicer. I'm going to put this part here on top. And then I'm going to add the head to my scarab. I want it to kind of angle up a little bit. So I'm going to put it kind of like here. So he's kind of like looking up. I think that would look good. And if you just kind of push against the other model magic, it should start to stick to it. I think that looks pretty good. So you can kind of see here sideways how his head is sticking up. And you see it kind of sticks to the other model magic. It sticks to itself very well. Okay, now we're gonna add the legs. So let's start off with the front legs first. And they're gonna be here, kind of like this. And I want there to be a little bit of space. I want it all to be flat. So it's gonna be kind of touching like 
like that. And curving upwards and touching the ground like that. So you can see here, see how my my scarab's legs are kind of lifted up. Yeah, I want them a little bit raised off so that there's a little bit of space. Makes it look a little more realistic. Okay. Now we'll add the side ones. And these ones I'm going to kind of curve again so that there's space. You see? space here. Add the next one. And then the last big legs. Add those. See this scarab? Did not skip leg day ever. If anything, he did too much leg day. He got these big old legs in the back. So he's nice and strong. You can kind of see how I'm curving the legs so that there's some space. And this bottom piece is really important because it allows you to have it uh, stick to the bottom and then that way this doesn't move too much. Final leg. Maybe we can go a little higher with that one. There we go. Kind of match that a little. Okay. Now you don't have to worry too much about these parts where they connect. You don't have to smooth it out or anything like that. Because we're actually going to cover it up with this next part. So now we have our beetle's legs all on. You can see he's got big back legs and some skinny front legs. And his head is kind of lifted. Oops. And his head is kind of lifted up right there. You see that? Now we're going to add some decoration here. I'm going to cover up this shell on the back. Now we can take our marker again and kind of flatten it out so that it stretches a little bit further. pieces here. Now we're going to cover up these parts here. It's okay if it's a little bit too big. Flatten it out. Beetle's looking pretty good. It's looking pretty realistic now. Okay. See, and by creating all the parts separately, it gets a lot of texture and a lot of depth. Now I think there's a few things we can add. I think we might want to add something like this on the top of the head. I think that would look pretty good. So since we have more clay, and if you have more clay too, you can do this also. I'm going to take a little bit more clay. And this one, 
I want to be purple. And I keep calling it clay, but it's actually model magic. Now we want to add a little bit of decoration to the top of the head here. Kind of like a plate, kind of like this stuff on the outside. So I'm kind of looking for a half circle shape. Now this might be too much clay, so I think I might take a little bit off. Looks pretty good. I like it. Got a little hat on now. It's kind of like a hat. And then we can take some of our extra clay here and add some details to the legs. Okay, that's looking good. So now we have a pretty big beetle there. But he can't see anything. So we need to add some eyes to our beetle. Take a little bit more clay. Excuse me, a little bit more model magic. I'm gonna grab a black marker this time. Okay, I think this color is good enough. It's not really black, but it's dark enough to, to be different. So then we're gonna take a little piece. And we're gonna make some big eyes so that he can see. I think that looks pretty good, but if I take a little bit, go white model magic now and put them on his eyes. Oh, that's looking even better. I like that. It's kind of cartoony. And then if I take another little drop of the dark clay and put that over the white. Look at that. He looks... He looks like he can see now. Look at that. That's pretty good. I think that looks great. So there we have it. We have our scarab beetle hanging out. So if you're still working on yours, keep working. And we're going to learn a little bit more about scarab beetles with Brian. Hello, my name is Brian Kramer. I am a research Egyptologist at the Robert and Francis Fullerton Museum of Art on the California State University San Bernardino campus. And I'm gonna show you um, some of the imagery that surrounds the scarab beetle as it was used in ancient Egypt. Now, you're probably following this because you have been participating in the Kids Discover Ancient Egypt uh, workshop and in the course of that, you may have made your own scarab out of clay. Um, that's a really um, appropriate thing to do, uh, to follow something that the Egyptians did because they made scarabs all over the place in their artwork. Now, so what is a scarab exactly? Well, a scarab is a beetle. It's a type of beetle. Scarab is actually its genus name. Um, Scarabaeus sacer. 
is, is its full, full scientific name. And it is not just any run-of-the-mill beetle, it is a dung beetle. And a dung beetle uh, has part of its living from collecting poop. It gathers poop up in the savannas of Africa into little balls, it rolls them around the savannas, um, and lays its eggs in the poop. Over time, the eggs hatch and the little baby beetles emerge from the ball of poop. And that image to the ancient Egyptians was fascinating and became one of the most important religious ideas that they put all over uh, their tombs, their coffins, and even they wore as jewelry. This over here is an image of a god from ancient Egypt. He's part of a line of gods on this stone panel. And you notice this god in particular has on his head a thing that looks like a ball. It's actually an image of the disk of the sun. And inside of that sun disk, there is an image of a scarab beetle. This is a, a sufficient symbol to indicate this god is the god named Khepri. That's spelled K-H-E-P-R-I, Khepri. Um, the Khepri beetle is another name that you may find in reference to the scarabs. In fact, that's the origin of the word, the scarab. Cheper. Cheper in ancient Egyptian means to transform or to become. And this god is the god who transforms from the old, very weak, and almost dying god of the sun who was in the underworld to the new, young, vibrant god um, of the sun who emerges when the sun emerges on the eastern horizon in the morning. Khepri. So the Egyptians used this image of Khepri as a religious symbol in their artwork, specifically tied to the idea of rejuvenation and transformation and becoming young again. Over here, I'm going to show you one of the places that they did this. In this display case, we have objects of mummification, uh, and in this corner, we especially have amulets that are placed on mummies. And one amulet that they used frequently in ancient Egypt on mummies was a faience jewel showing a scarab, a heifer beetle. And this is an example here. It actually consists of three parts. You have the, the part in the middle that is the beetle itself. And you have the two wings that are attached to the sides. Um, all of these were sewn into the linen of the mummy, the actual bandages. Uh, and so it would be attached specifically onto the chest of the mummy. The wings are important because the scarab beetle, when it, uh, it uh, is born or when it, when it disappears from view, extends these very long wings, which you wouldn't imagine it had underneath, underneath its carapace. It extends it and flies off um, with a great tumult of, of noise. You actually find these in California today. You'll know it coming from 10 feet away because it makes a huge buzzing noise. Um, so the Egyptians used this image of the scarab beetle emerging from the earth and flying off to its new life as an image that they wanted in their tombs. I'm going to show you another place where it occurs over here on an ancient Egyptian coffin. So on the coffin of Tadi Yusser here, you have in the middle a painted image of another scarab beetle. And this is a really nice one, I, I think, because not only do you have this full spread of the wings painted in red and blue, but you also have the beetle uh, pushing the blue ball uh, that represents uh, either the ball of poop or the sun disk as it moves across the sky. And in this case, it happens to have two uh, balls on the top and on the bottom, indicating perhaps uh, the idea of the continuity of the, the, the sun as it moves across the sky from one horizon to the other horizon. And the position of this scarab beetle on the mummy is usually where you find these kinds of things on the actual linen of the mummy. The, 
the faience uh, jewel that I showed you uh, just now could be uh, positioned somewhere on the stomach or somewhere on the chest. And that position is important because the Egyptians talked about it a lot when they wrote texts that they put in their tombs or they talked about uh, wishes that would happen to them when they died. And, and one of the wishes they really expressed is that in their tomb, the, the sun would emerge uh, through like a slit in the door uh, or just because it, it was miraculous and it would cast its light on the mummy. And this symbol of the, the scarab landing on the chest of the mummy is an image of this event. This event is really important because they thought that when the light touched the mummy, the mummy could become alive again. A lot, a lot I imagine like a seed planted in the ground when it receives the, the sunlight of uh, the, the, of the sun uh, falling on it, it actually finds new life and becomes something new. So they imagined you were revived by the sun landing on your chest. But that's not the only place that the Egyptians used this image of the scarab beetle. In fact, they liked the image so much that they made other varieties of jewelry uh, in the shape of scarab beetles. And over here in this case of amulets, you have in the corner an example of what is either a amulet that could be sewed anywhere on the mummy. And you find dozens of these inside of of the linen of actual mummies. Or it is actually an amulet that someone would use in the course of their business every day. Um, the Egyptians used this form, especially as of uh, 2000 BC and on, as signet rings. Now signet ring is something that used to be very common up until the beginning of the 20th century and you don't find it very much nowadays, but it is um, an alternative to making a signature on a document. What you can do is you can have a piece of jewelry made with a special design on it that is particular to say your family's uh, crest or just a design that has uh, perhaps a very ornate version of your signature on it. Um, in China they used to make, cut these into very ornate um, calligraphic images of the person's name. And you can use that piece of, of jewelry and stamp it in wax. And that adds a signature to that wax. You attach the wax to the document and the document is then signed and sealed with your name. Well, the ancient Egyptians did exactly the same thing. Uh, they used jewelry with ornate decorations on, on a flat side and stamped that into uh, not wax, but usually mud, um, and attached that to documents. They attached it to doors. They attached it to bags of food. They attached it everywhere that they wanted to acknowledge was theirs. It was, it was um, sealed with their name. And so one of the things that is great about these seals for archaeologists, especially, is that the way they were made in ancient Egypt over uh, 2,000 years was different. And um, you can actually as W. Ward did, uh, chart the individual features of, uh, of, that are included on a scarab seal according to the, the features that are found in the, the biology, the anatomy of the scarab. Uh, and it will appear differently from scarabs from, for example, the Middle Kingdom, and will be different from scarabs of the New Kingdom. So it's a great device that when you find it in the field, you know what that archaeological context dates to. So scarabs are particularly enamored by Egyptologists. Um, and those scarab uh, seals um, are something that probably led to the development of these things. These are really cool. Um, this is what's called a commemorative scarab. This is actually a, a model of one, so that's why I can handle it without gloves. Um, but they are very common in the New Kingdom, and especially under the reign of King Amenhotep III. He made dozens of these, and they went all over the Mediterranean. You can find them in Greece, you can find them in Israel, you can find them in Turkey. They're all over the place. And um, what they are is basically a large-scale version of the scarab seal. Um, and on the back, instead of uh, a, one particular design that um, signify the identity 
identity of one person for the purpose of a signature. It's a, a message or a commemorative um, uh, uh, design to promote the king. This is not an example from the reign of Amenhotep III. It's unusually uh, just a series of random hieroglyphs on the back, but many of these exist that show, that give accounts of his hunting exploits, how many lions he killed that year, how many bulls he managed to bag. Um, they commemorate his special marriages that he made with uh, the princesses of uh, the kingdoms to the north, for example. They also name his uh, favorite wife, Tia. So these are uh, a way for the king to promote himself. And we imagine that what happened was when the king sent a special envoy or a special envoy from another kingdom arrived, uh, they would hand this out as a, as, a, as a door prize. Here, take this home and give it to um, the king of the Mitanni. Uh, it's uh, a symbol of, of, of um, my generosity to him. And so the scarab was a versatile image from ancient Egypt, but it never really lost that idea of symbolizing the, the, the miraculous ability of the sun to renew itself in the course of every day in the hope that when you were a mummy, you could somehow do the same thing.